My talk is about patellofemoral tracking and its management algorithm. It is uh, the most important direction of maltracking is lateral direction and it ranges from mild degrees to frank dislocation and instability. It occurs mainly in adolescent population group and it represents only 3% of knee injuries and is almost 70% uh, related to sports activity. I'll talk about the anatomy and risk factors for the recurrence and algorithm for management. It is important to note that the patellar stability depends on the trochlear morphology once the knee is flexed beyond 30 degrees. So it is dependent on the bone configuration of the trochlea beyond this flexion. And if you have a long patellar tendon, in other words, if you have a patella alta, you will have less engagement of the patella early, and this may predispose to dislocation. The most important static stabilizer is the medial patellofemoral ligament, and it extends from between the medial epicondyle and the adductor tubercle to reach the, the patella, the upper half of the patella, and it has an insertion to the quadriceps tendon, and it represents 50% of the static stabilization from early extension from zero extension to 30 degrees of flexion. Vastus medialis is the most important dynamic stabilizer, and it acts and counteracts the vastus lateralis mainly by the vastus obliquus component, which has a, a horizontal direction. And it also acts by shortening the medial patellofemoral ligament in early 20 degrees flexion. We can have three types of patients complaining of maltracking. Patients with acute traumatic dislocation, which may lead to recurrent dislocation later on. And this occurs mainly in athletes, young population, adolescent group, and the chronic lax patients, which occur in women, uh, with male alignment, and the patient re uh, present to us with recurrent subluxation episodes, and the habitual one, which is painless, and usually occurs with each movement of the knee, and the pathology is mainly proximal, related to tight lateral structures. The most common mechanism of injury in the acute traumatic ones is non-contact twisting injury with valgus and, uh, and external rotation force to the leg. So, a direct blow to the medial aspect of the patella is less common. Having a recurrency after first time dislocation, to, according to many authors, it is related to the number of risk factors the patient had. So, it increases from 7% to nearly 80% with increasing the risk factors. Lewanen at the American Journal of Sports Medicine reported at 2013 a 70% recurrency in skeletally immature patients with trochlear dysplasia. So we have to identify the risk factors because the recurrence will depend on their presence. We have a major risk factors which is highly associated with the recurrence which is the trochlear dysplasia, the patella alta, and increased uh, the TTTG distance, we, we, that means lateralization of the tibial tibrosity and lateral patellar tilt. The other risk factors for recurrency are less important and includes knee valgus and genu recurvatum and generalized hyperlaxity, wide Q angle, and uh, many other things that, that counts to the recurrency, however, they are less important than the major one. Patellar instability severity score was described by Balkrick 2014, and he includes six risk factors, including the age and history of contralateral dislocation and trochlear dysplasia and patellar height and lateralization of the tibial tibrosi and the patellar tilt. And he gives score one point for each one, except the trochlear dysplasia two points. And if the patient scores more than four points, it is considered uh, uh, having a high, five times higher rate of recurrency. 
Parik 2017, he uses only four risk factors, including the skeletal immaturity, patellar height, using Catan de Cham, and history of contractor dislocation. And he reported that increasing the risk factors will increase the rate of the currency. And uh, he reported that having two or more risk factors, surgical option will be uh, recommended in these patients. It is important to identify the risk factors in each case to define which patients are going to recur to have their currency. Clinical evaluation including history of the trauma, the chronicity, level of activity, and history of contralateral dislocation, and including general and local. General examination including the malalignment of the patient if it is present like geno valgum, Rotational malalignment in the prone position should be assessed the gait of the patient and having a high perplexity by biting scale. Local examination include full knee examination for effusion and for tenderness over the medial aspect of the patella, the medial femoral condyle, and patella height can be assessed also clinically in sitting position and Q angle, patellar mobility. If it is more than two quadrants, it's abnormal and lateral patellar tail test to identify lateral structures tightening. Local examination includes also a patellar apprehension, patellar tracking. You can see the J sign on the video and the femoral version is very important. Having excessive antiversion also is, a, is, is an important risk factor. Tibial torsion, when we have the foot side angle more than uh, 20 degrees in prone position. Radiological evaluation, we will do everything, plain x-ray, CT scan and MRI. In the plain x-ray, ask for lateral view, skyline view, and long weight bearing films to have uh, to, to identify any coronal malalignment. Trochlear dysplasia is a major risk factor and is almost 96% present in patients with lateral patellar dislocation, according to Dijour. And he describes that having one at least of three signs may identify and confirm presence of trochlear dysplasia, which is the crossing sign, the trochlear bump, and double contour sign. In normal trochlea with normal depths, we have three lines that represents the lateral femoral condyle, the medial femoral condyle, and the floor. So we have no crossing between them. If we have a crossing, then we have a flat trochlea like this. If we have a convex trochlea, convex uh, uh, lateral epicondyle, lateral condyle, then we have like a double contour sign due to medial hypoplasia and convexity of the lateral. And the jour describes four types based on that. We have a shallow trochlea with crossing sign. This is mild type A. Type B, we have supratrochlear spur with a flat trochlea. And type C, we have the double contour sign, lateral convexity and medial hypoplasia. And in type D, we have combination between double contour and supratrochlear spur. This is type D dysplasia. And also trochlear morphology can be assessed using the sulcus angle the lateral trochlear inclination angle and medial trochlear inclination angle. And skyline view can show us the sulcus angle and other things like lateral convexity, medial hypoplasia, and patellar tilt. Patellar height can be assessed using a lateral radiograph using in cell salvati index and modified one. Blackburn and Peel index, Catan de Champ index, and it is very important and it is very re reliable. Patellar tilt, it is measured in the axial cuts of the CT and the MRI, and false results occur in the plain X ray due to the de degree of knee flexion we have. And it is an important risk factor in many patients with recurrent patellar dislocation. And it occurs due to medial laxity, lateral uh, retinacular titus, cellular alta trochlear dysplasia,
or combination of these factors. We can assess according to the jour by superimposed uh, uh, CT scan. We can measure the tibial T velocity to the trochlear groove distance. Uh, it's normal less than 15 millimeter, borderline from 15 to 20. More than 20, we have to do something about it uh, because it is a risk factor. MRI, oh, I I every risk yeah. this MRI, patellar tilt, lateral sulcus angle, lateral trochlear inclination angle, and the TT, TG distance also can be assessed using the MRI. What are the available options for us to do these patients? We, we have medial patellofemoral reconstruction. We can do tibial tuberosity osteotomy, femoral or tibial osteotomy in case of rotational or coronal malalignment, trochleoplasty, and in some cases, better reflector lead or lancening. <laughs> Algorithm for management. A patient with acute first time dislocation, classically, we, if there is no osteochondral fracture, we would go for conservative. If we have an osteochondral fracture, we we'll go for operative fixation. But that's, that's not as simple as this. We have, as we know, that increasing the risk factors increase the rate of the recurrence. So if we have a patient with acute dislocation with two or less risk factors, we have to do conservative treatment. If acute dislocation is with three or more, operative treatment is recommended in these patients. If we have a patient with acute primary patellar dislocation. Take a good history and do physical examination to identify any malalignment in this patient uh, and any risk, other risk factors like hyperlaxity. Uh, if there is tense effusion, uh, do aspiration. Uh, if no, do plain x-ray only. If we have a tense effusion, we will do aspiration. And if we found uh, him arthrosis, we will do x-ray and MRI. If no him arthrosis, we will do only x-rays. Then we, if we find displaced osteochondral fragment, we will do operative treatment for the fragment fixation and repair of the medial structures. Uh, if no displaced osteochondral fragment, we will conserve by immo immobilization in extension for three to six weeks, followed by knee rehabilitation. If we found in the plain x-ray displaced osteochondral fragment, we will do MRI and we will do fixation and medial uh, structure repair. And if no displaced osteochondral fragment, we will do immobilization in extension. If we have a case of recurrent lateral patellar dislocation, now there is no rule for conservative. It is always operative. We have to do something for the medial structures, which is usually the medial patellofemoral ligament reconstruction, plus a la carte approach. What is, does it mean, a la carte approach? It means that we identify the risk factors in this patient and we manage accordingly. In summary, in a patient with a recurrent patellar dislocation and skeletally immature, we'll check for the coronal malalignment. If we have a genovalgum more than 10 degrees and potential for growth more than one year, we'll do hemiepiphysiodesis. In case of rotational malalignment, we'll do femoral derotational osteotomy. Medial patellofemoral ligament reconstruction anatomical if the patient is near skeletal maturity, non-anatomical if the patient has potential for gross. Skeletally mature patient will address the risk factor present in the, in the patient. Uh, lateralized tibial tuberosity will do medialization. Patella alta will, we will distalize. Trochlear dysplasia, if type A, we will ignore it. Type B and D will do groove deepening. Type C, we will do lateral facet elevation or a resection wedge to decrease the lateral uh, uh, convexity. The medial patellofemoral ligament reconstruction is indicated in many patients. Patellar tilt, uh, if uh, it was more than 20 degrees, do lateral release, but not as a sole procedure. It is only done with other procedures as well. If we have rotational malalignment, we will do derotational osteotomy. 
It is important to know the landmarks for the medial patellofemoral ligament reconstruction, the upper half of the patella and chotel point. Thank you.